Okay, we can get started. People are still joining, but um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our continuing series. That was then, this is now, who's who in the Northwestern neighborhood. I'm Babette Henderson. I am the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement for the Feinberg School of Medicine. And before we get started, just a housekeeping note, we've had uh, many pre-submitted questions that Dr. Guggenheim will address at the end of his presentation. But if you'd like to ask an additional question, please type it in the Q&A section. And if time permits, we will address additional questions. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joseph Guggenheim, MD, is a retired orthopedic surgeon. He specialized in extremity reconstruction in adults and children, and also general pediatric orthopedics. Dr. Guggenheim is credited with 28 original scientific publications and book chapters and 66 scientific presentations. Dr. Guggenheim graduated from Rice University in Houston and Northwestern University Medical School. He completed his internship in the Northwestern program and his residency at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Dr. Guggenheim completed his fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. He served as president, program chair and publications editor of the Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction Society. For relaxation, he's participated in running and equestrian competitions, and in retirement, his new hobby is Chicago history. Dr. Guggenheim. Thank you, Babette. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank our Alumni Association uh, for inviting me to present this, uh, this lecture, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for tuning in today. So let's get started. Uh, for several years now, I've been giving walking tours of the Northwestern neighborhood, uh, but today we're going to do it a little differently. It's going to be a virtual tour, so we don't need to worry about sore feet, the weather, uh, or uh, traffic. The last tour I gave, we were interrupted by a snowstorm. Uh, we also uh, are going to, this is going to be a, a biographical tour. So instead of talking about the buildings themselves, I'll be talking about the names on the buildings, uh, the names on some of the streets and the neighborhood itself. Let's get started uh, on our tour at the corner of Fairbanks Court and Superior Street, uh, where uh, Wesley Memorial and Passamut Memorial used to face each other, and now Prentice Women's Hospital and the Lurie Research Center are, and meet our first uh, man, Nathaniel Kellogg Fairbank. Fairbank came to Chicago in 1855. Chicago was a very young town at the time. Uh, it only got its charter in 1837, so the town uh, city was only 18 years old. The population at that time was approximately 55,000, which would be the seating capacity of the old Deitch Stadium in Evanston. Chicago was growing very rapidly at this time and more than tripled its population between 1850 and 1860. Fairbank spelled his name Fairbank without an S, but his British ancestor spelled it Fairbanks as the street is named. He owned much of the land that uh, uh, became the Northwestern campus along with the Farwell family. He manufactured soap and lard as a byproduct of the uh, meat processing plants nearby and later expanded into cleansers and other baking products. Cooks were getting away from solid lard and wanted liquid vegetable shortening but the problem was cottonseed oil had a bad odor to it. The chief chemist in his lab was named David Wesson. So uh, he uh, discovered a process for deodorizing cottonseed oil and came up with Wesson oil. So next time you uh, use Wesson oil, think about Northwestern. Fairbanks company manufactured uh, uh, soap and lard, but then it got into washing powders, soap and other uh, cleaning products. He sold it to uh, Lieber Brothers and Procter and & Gamble, and I think they probably made a, a pretty penny from that. He did not live in this area. Instead, he lived with several uh, wealthy Chicagoans at 1802 uh, South Michigan Avenue. Uh, at this time, the, the land was mostly a desolate, swampy area uh, that he and uh, the Farwell family owned. There were very few, if any, residences in this area. Fairbank was president of the University of Chicago Board of Trustees and vice president and trader on the Chicago Board of Trade. He was a trustee of the Orchestral Association, 
which later became the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. No talk about Fairbank would be complete without talking about George Streeter, for whom Streeterville is named. Streeterville is the approximately uh, triangular area between uh, the river, Lakeshore Drive, and Michigan Avenue, with an extension uh, uh, pointing out in the lake uh, at uh, Navy Pier. Streeter was a private during the Civil War, never rose above that rank. He was also a drifter, a gun runner, a miner, vaudeville performer, logger, and he owned a traveling circus. He sold a circus in Indianapolis one day for $5,000. Uh, he said the circus featured animals, marionettes, and a Hindu mystery professor, whatever that was. Streeter uh, had a boat named the Rutan, and it ran aground on July 10th, 1886 off the uh, lakeshore. Uh, the legend is that uh, there was a storm and uh, the storm forced the uh, uh, boat onto a sandbar. But review of the uh, uh, weather records from that night show that there, were, there really was no storm. So the Rutan ran aground, and you can see on this artist's map that it was approximately the intersection of Superior and Fairbanks, where we just started our tour. At this time, uh, this area was underwater. It had not been uh, solid land until the uh, landfill came along after the fire of 1871. Fairbank, who owned the nearby land, initially allowed uh, Streeter to stay in this area until the Rutan was repaired. His, uh, 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 the uh, uh, developers, uh, uh, he encouraged the developers to dump their rubble uh, from the uh, fire around the sandbar to make landfill. And then he sold the lots to unsuspecting buyers. He collected property taxes and pocketed the money himself. His fellow hobos who lived on the sandbar nicknamed him Captain, but as I said, he never rose above private. He was in and out of jail many times. Fairbank tried unsuccessfully to evict him for 28 years uh, and was unsuccessful despite the aid of the uh, Chicago police and the Pinkertons. He was in and out of jail and reporters sought him out on slow news days for a good story. For 25 years, Streeter waved a document in the court showing that he was entitled to this land. He, he said it was not on the map for Chicago or Illinois, so he was subject only to the laws of the United States. He waved a document which he said was from uh, President Grover Cleveland giving him property rights. This was a forged deed and forensic analysis showed it was really from President Martin Van Buren for Robert Kinsey, an early Chicago uh, native. After he was evicted, uh, Streeter and his wife lived in a wagon on East Chestnut Street. Uh, he tr his family tried unsuccessfully after his death to sue the Chicago uh, title company and uh, the wealthy landowners in the uh, Gold Coast area, uh, but uh, the case was thrown out by the courts because Streeter never legally divorced his first wife. So now let's uh, take our tour and go south on Michigan Avenue uh, to the river and look across the river and we see upper and lower Wacker drives. Uh, they were dedicated in 1926, named after Charles Wacker. So why are we talking about Wacker? There's no Wacker General Hospital. There's no Wacker uh, Research Building. But if it weren't for Wacker, the medical center area may not have developed when it did. Because Wacker, uh, was largely responsible for the building of the Michigan Avenue Bridge in 1920. You can see in this old map that the easternmost crossing of the Chicago River was this zigzag structure uh, outlined in red, uh, which was the Rush Street uh, uh, Bridge. Uh, Wacker and uh, uh, Daniel Burnham advocated building a uh, bridge across at Michigan Avenue. Michigan Avenue ended at the river. Uh, you can see the uh, the southern end of Michigan Avenue at the lower Green Arrow. And the upper part was named Pine Street. That's the upper Green Arrow. Wacker was a member of the Commercial Club. This was a group uh, founded in 1877, consisting of 60 prominent Chica Chicagoans. Uh, and the requirements were conspicuous success and an interest in the general interest of Chicago. Uh, you can see at this uh, table uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Commercial Club, the man uh, with uh, his uh, grayish hair uh, closest to us is John Shedd, uh, for whom the Shedd Aquarium is named. Um, as you go counterclockwise around the table, the next to the last man on that side 
is John Farwell. Uh, the Farwell family, as I said, owned a lot of the land that later became the a medical school campus. Behind him is Charles Wacker. And then coming around the table counterclockwise, the next to the last man uh, is Daniel Burnham. Charles Wacker was the son of a, a German immigrant brewer, so his name was really Wacker, although everybody nowadays calls him Wacker. He worked with Daniel Burnham on the Plan of Chicago, which was published on July 4th, 1909. It was said at the time to be the best book on city planning ever written. Daniel Burnham wanted Chicago to become the city beautiful, like Paris or Washington, D.C. Wacker uh, published a textbook aimed at eighth graders. He said that at that time, children were old enough to understand what was going on, uh, yet young enough uh, he was going to get to them before they uh, dropped out of school. Uh, he would speak wherever he could assemble an audience. The goal was to convince Chicago that uh, they would benefit more from the plans uh, uh, of the Burnham plan than from uh, housing or public services. And this shows you what happened uh, uh, after the bridge was built. The a uh, large photograph on the left was taken in 1906 from Erie Street. Uh, this is probably taken at a, approximately the level of the 11 pavilion. You can see on the right side of that same picture, the uh, water tower and the pumping station. The two pictures on the right show Pine Street looking north and looking south. And you can see the uh, water tower and the pumping station uh, before 1920. And this picture was allegedly taken in 1926 after the bridge had been built in 1920. And if we look at the bottom center of the picture, you can see the U-shaped Drake Hotel. And then going south on Michigan Avenue, you see the Allerton. And then uh, at the river, you see the Tribune Tower. Across Michigan Avenue, you just barely see uh, the Wrigley Building. And then coming north again on Michigan Avenue, you see the steeple of Fourth Presbyterian Church. And at the very bottom center of the picture, you see the uh, Rockefeller McCormick Mansion. Uh, the reason I say this was allegedly taken in 1926 is the uh, Ward Building was built in 1925, 26, and you see no sign of it in this picture. You do see the, the furniture mark going up, however, on Lakeshore Drive. Wacker Drive was uh, uh, built by combining Market Street, shown at the red arrow, and Water Street, shown at the green arrow. Market was often used as an open air market with horse drawn carriages uh, to sell uh, in an open air market. The uh, uh, Wacker Drive was uh, uh, dedicated in 1926, but Wacker was too ill to attend. His grandson, Charles Wacker III, uh, was an uh, international socialite and an owner of race horses. Uh, he also had the uh, dubious honor of uh, uh, being accused of the largest uh, estate and income tax evasion case in Chicago history in 1993. He was accused of filing false tax returns, creating dummy corporations and hidden bank accounts, and even defrauding his own mother. Uh, the case was dropped in 2002 because uh, uh, Wacker disappeared. He was last seen in uh, uh, the UK or in South Africa in uh, 2014 when he would have been 93 years old, but he has not been seen since. Wacker Drive is also the only street in Chicago that has a north, south, east, and west component because it crosses State Street and Madison. Now let's go back north on Michigan Avenue uh, to the Medical Center and meet Aaron Montgomery Ward, whose name is on the Ward Building. Ward left school at age 14 and went to work at a, a barrel safe factory for 25 cents a day. He then went to a, a brick kiln stacking bricks for 30 cents a day. He said these were educational jobs because he learned he was not cut out for this kind of work. He became a shoe salesman at age 15, working for $6 a month plus board. He moved to Chicago in 1865. For two years, he worked with Field, Palmer and Leiter the retail and wholesale company that later became Marshall Field and Company. He became concerned about the plight of the rural customers, thinking that the big city merchants uh, overcharged and underserved their rural customers. He relied heavily on the use of the railroads for delivery of his merchandise and uh, uh, relied on his association with the Granger's rural organization uh, to uh, uh, find customers. His business was destroyed by the fire of 1871. 
He reopened the business with his brother-in-law, George Thorne, for whom the Thorne Auditorium was named. Uh, they combined their uh, money, and they had $2,400 between them to open uh, uh, the Montgomery Ward and Company. They published their first mail order catalog in 1872. The uh, uh, motto was satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. A lot of their competitors thought they were crazy for making this kind of guarantee. The first catalog was published in 1872. It was a single sheet showing 150 items and Ward wrote it himself. The catalog grew rapidly and by 1874, it was 32 pages. Two years later, it was 152 pages and it became known as the Wish Book. His rival, uh, Sears Roebuck, uh, uh, was way behind uh, uh, Ward in the catalog business. They didn't mail out their first catalog until 1896. By 1897, the Ward catalog was a thousand pages. They opened their first retail store in 1926. So that would have been 13 years after uh, Ward died. From the catalog, you could buy just about anything. You could buy the usual clothing and uh, kitchen items. You could buy barbed wire, steam engine, a saddle, baby chickens. You could even buy a six room house, six bedroom house. Uh, you just uh, placed your order, and when it came to the railroad station, you went down, picked it up, and put your own house together. Ward was also a champion for preserving the lakefront. Uh, he wanted the uh, lakefront to remain forever clear and free of buildings. He did not want it to end up like Milwaukee or Cleveland with factories and warehouses on the lakeshore. So he campaigned to preserve the uh, park as a public park with playgrounds and concert venues. He sued the city to remove buildings and prevent further buildings. He fought Marshall Field for years because Field wanted to place a museum in the park. Ward thought that the uh, museum was just something to glorify uh, uh, Mr. Field. Uh, he knew that uh, if he lived long enough, uh, uh, the case would uh, be uh, won by uh, uh, the Ward and, and his uh, friends. And uh, uh, he did. Uh, Marshall Field died in 1906, so Ward won the case. Uh, the Field Museum, shown on the left side of this picture now, is not really in Grant Park. The Art Institute was grandfathered in the park, and the uh, Pritzker Pavilion and Crown Fountain are considered works of art and not really buildings. Ward's office building was at the intersection of Madison and Michigan Avenue, built in 1899. At the time, it was the tallest building in Chicago at 394 feet. Ward had an unobstructed uh, view of the lake in Grant Park, and some people think that maybe that was why he wanted to preserve the park, so he would always have a good view, uh, but uh, he was probably more altruistic than this. Uh, the, uh, observat the pyramid had an observatory in it, which became a tourist attraction. It is interesting to note that 80 years later, his rival, Sears and Roebuck, uh, had the tallest building in Chicago, uh, with an observatory which became a tourist attraction. The building still stands at 6 North Michigan. Uh, the observatory and pyramid are gone and now it houses 119 luxury condos. His widow, Elizabeth Cobb Ward, gave over $8 million to the medical school and this has a current value of almost $120 million. She died before seeing the interior of the building, however. She came back from a long vacation in uh, Cal California on the train one day, and she was taken to see the interior of the building, but uh, she, she could not gain access, so she was going to come back the next day. She died during the night, uh, so she never did see the interior of the ward building. Some people say that uh, uh, her gift was contingent up, up upon admitting women to uh, the medical school, but according to Dr. Leslie Airy and his definitive history of the med school, she was surprised to learn that the school was not co-ed, but her gift was not contingent upon admitting women. Now let's go across the street to Passivant Memorial Hospital and meet William Passivant. The hospital was built in 1929 and demolished in 2001. Passivant was a Lutheran pastor. He had a congregation in Pennsylvania. He became a saint in the Lutheran church. He also published Lutheran literature. He was born in Pennsylvania, but his father uh, had immigrated from Germany to escape religious persecution and Napoleonic Wars. Passivan established institutions for orphans, uh, the elderly, and epileptics in the Midwest and in Pittsburgh. 
and other places in Pennsylvania. His first hospital was in Pittsburgh, and then it became part of the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. William Ogden, who was Chicago's first mayor, urged Passamon to build a hospital in Chicago. He did this and called it Deaconess Hospital, and it was at the intersection of Dearborn and Ontario. It had only 15 beds. The neighbors were opposed to the hospital because they said it was a source of deadly contagion. The hospital was destroyed by the 1871 fire. Passamon sold the burnt remains of the hospital and the property for $1.50. There is now a breakfast restaurant at this intersection where you cannot even buy a cup of coffee for $1.50. After that, uh, Passamon opened another hospital, Emergency Hospital, opened in 1885, which he renamed Passamon Memorial. It took care of a lot of trauma because it was near the police station, rail yards, and factories. Passamon wanted to build a larger hospital, uh, but he died in 1894, uh, so he, uh, it was never opened. His son took over running the hospital, and he also wanted to build a larger hospital in uh, his father's name, but he died in 1902. So uh, neither William Passman Sr. or Jr. ever saw a Passman Memorial Hospital, which was built in uh, 1929. The other Passman hospitals around the country uh, uh, are in Jacksonville, Illinois. It was founded in 1875. And then the one in Milwaukee is now the Aurora Sinai Medical Center. So now let's go across the street to Wesley Memorial Hospital and meet uh, John Wesley. Wesley Hospital was opened in 1888 at Dearborn and Ohio. It was the second Methodist hospital in North America and the first one west of the Mississippi. It was named for uh, uh, John Wesley. Wesley never visited Chicago. Uh, he died in uh, 1791 and the first uh, permanent residence in uh, uh, Chicago was 17. Uh, 99, so uh, he, he never saw Chicago. He did visit Savannah, Georgia. But Wesley Memorial Hospital, the one which most of us are familiar with, uh, was not a memoriam to John Wesley. Instead, it was built in memory of uh, William Deering Howe and Abby Deering Howe. James Deering donated $1 million in, in memory of his father and sister in 1914. Now remember that the uh, board building and the rest of the medical center did not open until 1925 and after. So Deering had given $1 million for a teaching hospital uh, when there was really no medical center. So the hospital uh, is, was built in memory of William Deering, his father. Deering was trained as a physician. His father owned a wool mill and he uh, made uh, some money uh, uh, during the Civil War making uniforms for Union soldiers. He fell into hard times and his son, William, uh, uh, went into the wool business and left medicine. Uh, Deering was successful with the business in uh, Maine and in New York. He was attracted to Chicago in the 1870s uh, because of the real estate boom. He had $40,000 earmarked for uh, investing in real estate, but instead he invested it in a friend's Reaper Works. Uh, he was in competition with Cyrus McCormick who invented the Reaper. McCormick lacked an efficient binder for grain. Uh, he was using, uh, uh, McCormick was using a metal wire, but it broke, it cut into the grain, and when it broke, the metal fragments would injure livestock. Uh, so Deering uh, developed an improved twine for binding. It was made from uh, manila hemp from the Philippines. He convinced a, uh, a Pennsylvania company to make, uh, uh, Pennsylvania Rope Company to make twine as a binder from uh, Mexican Cecil fibers and uh, uh, manila hemp. Uh, so his early success was in the making the binding, not the reaper. Uh, you can read all about it in this book, which you can buy on Amazon, but I really doubt that it's a page turner. So McCormick and Deering were in competition. McCormick knew that Deering was a better businessman, although uh, McCormick had invented the reaper. Uh, they uh, negotiated and they combined their firms to uh, make International Harvester in 1902. International Harvester later became Navistar, a leading manufacturer of large trucks. McCormick uh, was uh, flashy and uh, had uh, uh, elaborate houses and uh, people wanted to keep up with the uh, comings and goings of the McCormick family. Deering preferred to live quietly with his Methodist friends in Evanston. 
He served on the Northwestern Board of Trustees for 38 years and was board president for 10 years. He made many large grants to Northwestern and uh, uh, five generations of Deerings have uh, given to Northwestern. Several times the trustees offered to change the name of the university to Deering University, but uh, the Deering family uh, modestly declined the offer. So let's go down Superior Street now to uh, Lakeshore Drive and Superior to Abbott Hall and meet Wallace Calvin Abbott and Clara Abbott. Wallace Abbott grew up on a farm in Vermont. His father decided his education was complete when he was 14, but his mother realized that he had potential to become a doctor. So uh, after working in the fields for a couple of years, uh, he went, returned to school. He uh, graduated from Dartmouth and the University of Michigan Medical School, paying his own way. At the time, medical practices often were combined with uh, uh, drug stores where uh, drugs were actually made by the physician. Um, Abbott remembered his good times in the Midwest and uh, uh, left Vermont uh, to move back to uh, the Midwest, moving to Chicago and buying a, a medical practice for $1,000. He moved in uh, uh, an apartment in uh, the Ravenswood area with his new bride, Clara. In the apartment uh, kitchen, he manufactured medications for his practice. He heard about the Burgrave technique from a friend. Burgrave was a Belgian surgeon who made solid medicines, uh, which made dosing more accurate and increased the life of the medicine. Uh, and these were called alkaloid, uh, called dosimetric granules. Today, we might call these pills or tablets. The active ingredient was called an alkaloid. Abbott was criticized by the American Medical Association as leading the alkaloid cult. Uh, he was editor of the Alkaloid Clinic Journal, which later became the American Journal of Clinical Medicine. And he changed the name of uh, Abbott Alkaloid uh, to uh, Abbott Laboratories, uh, trying to get rid of the alkaloid uh, reputation. Uh, among other medicines, he made laxatives, tapeworm medicines, and toothache medicines. Business boomed and uh, Abbott had to get his friends and relatives from Vermont to move to Chicago to help him run his business. But Abbott preferred to practice medicine even though the, uh, he was becoming very wealthy uh, from pharmaceuticals. And he preferred uh, practicing medicine, making house calls on his bicycle. Uh, Abbott Laboratories uh, did very well uh, during the First World War because they started making patented German medicines that were no longer available in the US. Abbott Labs have made penicillin, Nambutal, Pentothal, Similac, Insure, Cyclamate, and they have spun off AbV, uh, which now makes Humira. The Abbotts moved to 4605 North Hermitage in 1891, and this uh, single family 7,000 square foot house still stands at the intersection. Two years ago, it sold for 1.75 million. His widow, Clara Abbott uh, was the first corporate uh, board director in the United States, running Abbott Labs after uh, uh, Mr. Abbott died. Her will established the Clara Abbott Foundation to benefit uh, Abbott employees, and the foundation is still in existence. The foundation gave $1.7 million for the construction of Abbott Hall in 1940. Uh, so uh, neither uh, uh, Wallace nor Clara ever saw Abbott Hall because uh, they they died back in the 20s. Now let's go back across Superior Street and meet Joy Morton, for whom the Morton Building is named. Joy was named after his, a maternal ancestor. Uh, he and his parents were interested in horticulture. His father was Secretary of, the Ag of Agriculture under uh, President uh, Grover Cleveland and was instrumental in the founding of Arbor Day. Joy and his brother were in several businesses, uh, lumber, sand and gravel, and salt. Salt was used uh, in the uh, processing of meat in the nearby uh, meat packing industries, uh, slaughtered in the, stack, in the stockyards. Morton added magnesium carbonate to the salt to keep it free flowing, later changed it to calcium silicate. And the motto of the company became, when it rains, it pours. The Umbrella Girl logo first appeared in Good Housekeeping Magazine in 1914. And you can see how she's changed over the years, but she still has uh, the salt and uh, the uh, large umbrella over her. 
Dr. David Murray Cowie uh, at the University of Michigan in the 20s uh, recommended adding iodine to table salt to prevent endemic goiter. Morton and his son were very reluctant to change the formulation for their table salt because it did not make up a large proportion of their business. But in the 30s, he changed his mind and uh, uh, started having these, uh, uh, these uh, advertisements uh, uh, that, that we was criticized for uh, saying, if you want your children to escape being handicapped by this disorder, begin to use Morton iodized salt at once. And the uh, italics are his. Uh, the first uh, uh, Mrs. Morton uh, had a prolonged illness and uh, died and she was cared for by a nurse uh, who uh, uh, Joy married after uh, his first wife died. Uh, the wife's, uh, the uh, uh, nurse's name and then his second wife was named Margaret Gray. She was a Northwestern alum and a philanthropist. She donated $1.8 million for a building in memory of her husband. Uh, this became the Morton Building. She wanted it to be a building for neurosurgery, but uh, restrictions during World War II and runaway construction costs after the war prevented it from being a neurosurgery building. With the consent of the courts and the heirs, uh, the building was changed to a research building, uh, which it is today. Uh, the Morton family had a large estate in uh, DuPage County, which became the Morton Arboretum. Morton, like Ward, had an unobstructed view of Grant Park and the lake from his uh, office building in the Railway Express building. This building on Michigan Avenue used to have a Santa Fe logo on it and then a Motorola uh, logo. Now let's meet Foster McGaw, for whom the old medical center is named the McGaw Medical Center. McGaw grew up, was, he was born in North Carolina. He grew up in Iowa. His mother was uh, from uh, England. She was a concert pianist trained all over Europe and had performed for Queen Victoria. His father was a Presbyterian minister and missionary. He had a grandfather who was a physician. Uh, he grew up in uh, uh, Iowa, uh, but he left uh, Iowa uh, for Chicago on graduation night from high school. He, uh, uh, because of financial problems in the family, had to quit high school after a sophomore year and uh, uh, dropped out of school, worked for Standard Oil for a couple of years, and then went back to high school, completing his junior and senior years in only one year. He uh, sold surgical instruments out of Chicago and then went in the Marines. After the Marines, he returned to Chicago to start his own hospital supply company. Uh, before uh, his company, uh, surgical instruments were sold to individual doctors, uh, individual companies sold to individual doctors. McGaw realized that it was probably more efficient to, for one company to sell, for multiple companies to hospitals themselves and not to the individual doctors. He founded American Hospital Supply Corporation in Evanston when he was only 25. And uh, this company was purchased later by Baxter Travenol Laboratories. McGaw joined the Northwestern Board of Trustees in 1950. He became friends with uh, University President Roscoe, J. Roscoe Miller at the time. They played golf together Miller told McGaw that the school needed a basketball arena because the uh, basketball team was playing at Evanston High School. McGaw said that athletics were really not one of his priorities, but then Miller told him that the uh, Assembly of the World Council of Churches was going to meet in, uh, in, uh, at Northwestern in 1954 and they needed a place to meet. And McGaw said, well, this was more of his liking, to his liking. So he uh, built the uh, or gave the money for the McGaw Memorial Hall, which he dedicated in memory of his father, Reverend Francis uh, McGaw. Uh, he said that his father uh, uh, more closely resembled the Apostle Paul than any person he had ever met. So the McGaw, uh, he donated the uh, gymnasium auditorium, uh, and this became the, uh, uh, this was a, a both an auditorium and a gymnasium, and it was the largest auditorium north of the loop for many years. Uh, it has now been uh, uh, modified to the uh, Welsh Ryan Arena. He gave the McGaw Chapel at the Evanston campus in honor of his mother, Alice McGaw. Uh, uh, he said it was a haven where students could refresh themselves through meditation and devotion. It's hard to get a photograph that really does this uh, building justice, 
Uh, if you've never seen it, it's something I would highly recommend. The stained glass windows are absolutely magnificent. He also gave the Vail Chapel on the Everson campus in honor of his stepdaughter. Uh, McGaw's first wife died in 1919, and uh, then he, uh, he didn't remarry for 30 years. Uh, he, uh, he married uh, Ms. Vail, and the, uh, his stepdaughter died from polio at age 24, three months after giving birth to one of their children. It's, it is also a magnificent building. McGaw endowed the uh, McGaw Medical Center, our medical center in 1966. This is the entity that unites the school with all the uh, hospitals. In 1977 alone, he donated $1 million to 17 other universities. It's estimated he gave away at least uh, over $100 million. He wanted to distribute the bulk of his estate before his death and said he was only God's steward and these possessions did not belong to him. Now let's go to Prentice Hospital, again, at the corner of Superior and Fairbanks Court, the new hospital at least is, and to meet the Prentice family. The Prentice name comes from uh, 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 John Rockefeller, Mr. and Mrs. John Rockefeller Prentice. Um, Ms. Abra Prentice uh, donated money uh, for the hospitals in honor of her parents. Uh, she is the great granddaughter of John D. Rockefeller and the granddaughter of Ezra Parmalee Prentice. Parmalee Prentice was a descendant of uh, the founder of Yale University. Uh, he was a graduate of Harvard Law School. He did some legal work for the Rockefeller family, his in-laws, but he was very interested in uh, the uh, uh, increasing the world population and the decreasing food supply. And he wanted to uh, develop some superior breeds of livestock, especially cattle and chickens. Uh, Abra uh, married uh, John Anderson, uh, who wrote for the Tribune and Time Magazine, and she is now married to James Wilkin. She dedicated the uh, hospital uh, to the memory of her parents. Uh, John Rock Prentice uh, dropped out of Yale. According to the New York Times, he was suspended from Yale uh, for cutting classes. His family uh, cut off his financial support at the time. So he had to uh, go to work. He worked in a hardware firm and shoveled snow in Boston for four years under a pseudonym in order to get enough money to go back to school. He returned to Yale where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and then paid his own way through Yale Law School um, working at a hospital switchboard at night. He married Abby Cantrell of Chicago in 1941 and she also worked, she worked for his law firm when he was practicing law. Uh, he, like his father, I was very interested in improving livestock. Uh, he pioneered artificial insemination, frozen semen, and in vitro fertilization in cattle. His company became the American Breeder Service. With the help of Union Carbide, uh, uh, they developed an insulated container for frozen semen using liquid nitrogen, which would hold it at minus 320 degrees instead of dry ice, which would only hold it for 110 degrees. So this made artificial insemination much more efficient than dropping. Uh, small vials of uh, fresh semen out of uh, airplanes to uh, uh, technicians waiting on the ground. Now let's meet uh, the Feinberg family, Reuben Feinberg, uh, for whom the school is named and also the Feinberg Pavilion at Northwestern Memorial. Mr. Feinberg was born in South Dakota. Uh, his family moved to Chicago for their son's education, thinking that they could get a better education in Chicago than in uh, North, uh, South, in South Dakota. He graduated from University of Illinois in Chicago with a degree in pharmacy, but never practiced pharmacy. Uh, he was the bank president of Jefferson State Bank. Uh, he and his family were real estate developers on the west side of the loop, also investing in office buildings and shopping centers. He and his brothers uh, created the Feinberg Foundation to honor their parents, Joseph and Bessie Feinberg. And you can see the picture of the brothers uh, in the background of this uh, a, a portrait of him. He had a heart problem in 1987. He lived in the Lake Point Towers. Um, an ambulance took him to Northwestern. Uh, he had said that if the ambulance had turned right instead of left, he probably would have given his money to a different medical school. In gratitude, he founded the Cardiovascular Research Institute. In 2002, 
uh, he, did, he donated $75 million to the medical school and then died the same year. Uh, the school was renamed in his honor. You know, he must have been an amazing man. This is what some of his uh, friends said about him. Uh, uh, dean of the medical school, uh, Dean Landsberg, Gary Mecklenburg, the uh, former CEO of Northwest, Northwestern Medical Healthcare, and university president Harry Beenan. It was said he had an unassuming personality, a wry sense of humor, a keen interest in Chicago, and evangelistic dedication to the medical school. Now for our final stop, let's go over to Chicago Avenue and meet uh, the Luries, Anne and Robert Bob Lurie, uh, for whom the uh, Children's Hospital is named. Anne grew up in Canada. Uh, her mother told her to do a good deed daily, and this is how she tried to live her life. She was a graduate of the University of Florida. She moved to Chicago in 1973 and was a critical care nurse at the old Children's Memorial Hospital. She said uh, uh, she had uh, uh, divorced uh, a wealthy man uh, and uh, uh, had been through a rotten marriage and swore she would never marry another wealthy man or even get involved with one. Bob Lurie was an engineering graduate of the University of Michigan where he got his bachelor and master's degree. Uh, he came to Chicago and was a real estate investor and partner with Sam Zell, part owner of the Bulls and White Sox. And it was said he had a knack with numbers brilliant mind, quick wit, and warm spirit. They met in the elevator at the Sandberg Village Apartments on their way to do their laundry. Uh, and this is not uh, Bob and Ann in the picture. They struck up a conversation because they both had key chains to British cars, his an MG, uh, hers a Triumph. He asked her to help him sort his laundry. She thought maybe he was just trying to find out if she was a helpful person. She said uh, with his, as she described it, bozo style red hair, he did not look wealthy. Uh, the two of them married in 1977. He developed cancer uh, at age 46 in 1990, colon cancer. And she quickly tried to learn about his business dealings and even bought a copy of uh, Accounting for Dummies to learn uh, about uh, his businesses. Their philanthropic endeavors included the Cancer Center at Northwestern, several projects at the University of Michigan, Millennium Park, medical school and uh, medical uh, facilities and schools in Africa, uh, which started out as a single trailer and then uh, is expanded now to 20 buildings, Greater Chicago Food Depository, and a spay neuter uh, program to reduce the number of unwanted pets in Chicago. One of her children became sick after eating a tainted piece of uh, chicken four days after she buried her husband. Uh, the prognosis was dire but uh, the child was saved by the doctors at Children's Memorial. They approached her about uh, contributing to the uh, building fund, but she held out until they agreed to build a uh, children's hospital in the downtown medical center, and then gave a hundred million dollars donation to build this hospital. On the day after Christmas in 2014, she married uh, film editor Mark Luheim. Uh, she said she's a self-described hippie at heart, they got married in 11 degree weather in uh, front of a fishing shack in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with their golden doodle Sophie and a few friends as witnesses. The picture on the right shows her with uh, former Mayor Emanuel and Sarah Jessica Parker. And you can see she is smiling. It is almost impossible to find a picture of Anne where she is not smiling, somebody who really enjoys what she is doing. I'll leave you with these uh, two quotes uh, uh, from the Luries. Uh, Anne said, I refer to some philanthropic concerns as hovering in a helicopter, throwing out money. But philanthropy doesn't mean just giving away money. In the dictionary, it means loving one's fellow man. And Bob said, smell the roses, kiss your wife, hug your kids, because you can't predict what the next moment will bring. Truly an amazing couple. Uh, thank you. And uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Guggenheim. That was a wonderful presentation. And we do have some questions that were pre-submitted that we would love to ask you. Um, the first one is, would you please give a brief history of the Carriage House and the Galter family? Uh, yes, uh, it's a tough audience. Uh, they submitted some tough questions, but I tried to do some research and uh, let me tell you what I found. Uh, the Carriage House was uh, built in uh, 1926. Uh, it was a five-story garage 
And I never looked at it that carefully when I was in, uh, a med student, but it, I saw pictures of it on a, a Dr. Uh, Boberg's presentation. And if you look at it, it does look like a high rise building sitting on top of a uh, closed in garage. So the first five stories were a garage and then it was at, uh, became a 27 story high rise in 1960. Um, it was uh, torn down in uh, 2005 to uh, build the uh, uh, Lurie Children's Hospital. It took a year to uh, tear it down because uh, it needed asbestos abatement. Uh, it housed uh, some retail businesses on the first few floors, uh, including Eli's, the place for steak, which uh, was there from 1960 until the building was torn down. Uh, the Galters were uh, Jack and Dolly, uh, born in 1904, both of them were. Uh, Jack died in 1993 and Dolly died in 2001. Their, uh, uh, one of their most recent gifts was a $10 million gift uh, to improve the uh, medical library uh, at uh, Feinberg. Uh, they were uh, quite a couple. Uh, he was an entrepreneur, manufacturer, and a real estate uh, uh, developer. Uh, he uh, he uh, and his uh, parents were uh, uh, Russian immigrants. Um, he played in a jazz band from uh, age 16 to 1929 uh, and performed in a uh, nightclub, which is now, it was owned by the mafia and uh, is now where the, uh, interestingly, where the, the Galter Pavilion is. Uh, after that, uh, he uh, met Dolly in 1925. At the time when they got married, they only had a hundred dollars between them. Uh, but uh, he was quite a Renaissance man. He invented several products and had patents as sunglasses, uh, razors, uh, box camera, uh, cigarette lighter, uh, irons, and uh, bicycle lights. Uh, this, these were his first businesses. Uh, so he made some money that way. But by the early 1950s, uh, he became a real estate investor and uh, had the property that the Galter uh, carriage house was built on. Uh, Dolly said that anything Jack touched turned to gold, that he had the Midas touch and that he made the money, but she spent it. Uh, it was said that she knew everybody in Chicago uh, from Al Capone to heads of state. Um, they began making philanthropic uh, 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 donations uh, uh, totaling over $100 million, especially to uh, medical uh, uh, causes, and not only uh, Feinberg, but Covenant Hospital, Children's Memorial, Lutheran General, and the Rehab Institute. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, will you be mentioning the fortnightly club at 120 East Bellevue? Uh, yes, uh, that, that building, uh, 120 East Bellevue, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, alum that asked, asked the question asked about was, was this building uh, uh, built uh, before the fire? Uh, no, it right, was, that's true. Uh, it was built uh, uh, in uh, uh, 1891, completed in 1893. The fire was 1871. This area, uh, 120 East Bellevue, uh, if it wasn't underwater, it was a swamp known as Frog Pond at the time before the landfill was completed. The building was uh, uh, designed by the architectural firm McKim, Mead, and White, and it was owned by the uh, Lathrop family. It was called the Lathrop House. Brian Lathrop was a uh, real estate developer and a patron of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He donated the money uh, for the land and also the, the building where the orchestra performs. Uh, his wife was from Vermont and together they owned the largest collection of Whistler etchings uh, in the United States and donated them to the Art Institute. The Fortnightly Club, which has been there uh, since uh, the 1920s, uh, was founded in 1876. So that was only five years after the uh, Chicago fire. Uh, it, it first included only 24 women who wanted uh, uh, to form a literary club. Some of the early members included Bertha Palmer, whose husband was uh, Potter Palmer. Uh, uh, she was also the queen of uh, Chicago society at the turn of the century. Uh, also Jane Adams, uh, the founder of the Hull House and Dr. Sarah Hackett Stevenson, who was the first female American Medical Association member. The house is a, uh, is a Georgian style, uh, which became popular in, uh, in the Gold Coast at the time. 
Before that, the uh, uh, Richardson Romanesque style was popular. Though some of the buildings still survive with uh, the these heavy granite blocks, but the uh, Georgian pattern was a, a much lighter. Uh, was characterized by its symmetry. Uh, uncharacteristically, the door is placed asymmetrically on the Lathrop House. Um, but uh, since uh, they moved into the uh, Lathrop House, the uh, fortnightly club has continued uh, to be a women's club and is probably the oldest women's club uh, in uh, uh, Chicago uh, starting in 1922. Great, thank you. Um, another question, what has uh, become of Abbott Hall and are there any residences on the downtown campus? Um, Abbott Hall, uh, people always ask about this. Uh, it is no longer a residence. Um, it um, uh, contains the bursar's office, uh, uh, he, uh, human resources, uh, some research, uh, financial aid, uh, housekeeping and offices like that, and also the bookstore. Uh, but uh, it is no longer a, uh, a residence. Uh, the problem with it is, uh, it would be very difficult to retrofit it for central air conditioning. Uh, by the way, it, when it was built in 1940, it was the tallest uh, dormitory in the world. Um, and also another reason for not doing anything with this, especially tearing it down, replacing it, is underneath it are some of the uh, components for the uh, uh, world's uh, internet uh, network. Uh, so it'd be uh, dangerous to uh, uh, try to tear it down and replace it. So it still survives, but uh, it is no longer a residence. The only residence uh, that uh, Northwestern owns anymore uh, is the Worcester House, it's mostly used for short-term housing. Uh, some uh, residents and fellows use it. Um, and also, uh, like if you're coming to Chicago for chemotherapy or something, uh, uh, you can live there. But it's, uh, it's not really on the campus, so it's not considered on-campus housing. But it is owned by Northwestern. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is from an alum who said they lived at the Lakeshore Club between 1982 and 1986. And if you could give any more information on the Lakeshore Club. Lakeshore Club also is called the Lakeshore Center. It was built in 1927. Uh, it was a private athletic club containing even a uh, Olympic sized swimming pool at the time. Uh, the university bought it in 1977 uh, for student housing and sold it in the early 2000s. And it still stands. Uh, uh, it's a retirement home now for the elderly. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the entrance uh, is not on Lakeshore Drive, even though it has a Lakeshore Drive address. And this was a, a characteristic of many buildings built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They wanted the status of a Lakeshore Drive address, but did not have the entrance on Lakeshore Drive. Uh, the Lakeshore Club uh, uh, entrance is actually on East Pearson. And there is a, a, a mural showing uh, uh, scenes from Chicago history in it, uh, which was built in, uh, I think they were painted in 1938. Uh, I don't know if they're still there or not, but uh, it had some murals that uh, were, uh, that showed Chicago history. Great, thank you. Um, could you please give us a little history on the casino club? That's our neighbor to the north. Sure. Uh, the Casino Club uh, was considered the most exclusive club in uh, Chicago, according to the uh, Tribune. Uh, it uh, uh, is named uh, the Casino uh, because it is a, uh, based on definition, a building for uh, 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 social amusements, uh, not, there's no gambling there. Uh, it originally limited its membership to 400. Uh, it is unmarked, uh, has an unlisted phone number, is very private. Um, the, uh, it opened in 1914 uh, on land leased from uh, uh, Potter and Bertha Palmer. Uh, 12 years later, uh, they moved slightly um, east to its current site. Uh, in the 1960s, the uh, uh, developers for the John Hancock Center uh, wanted to build two towers. Uh, and by the way, uh, the building was called the John Hancock Center. It was always called the Center. Uh, I mistakenly for years called it the John Hancock Building, but it's the John Hancock Center. And the reason for that is that um, 
it was going to be two twin towers, but the developers built the one facing Michigan Avenue and then they wanted to build one east on the property where the uh, casino club sits. Well, the president of the club at that time was named Doris uh, Winterbotham. Winterbotham family uh, was fa important in the, uh, in the development of the uh, uh, Columbian Expedition of 1893. Uh, and Doris Winterbotham was president. And the developer sent her a letter about uh, building a uh, tower at the casino club property. She dropped in her desk and never opened it. She just ignored it. And uh, the, the uh, builders, uh, developers uh, uh, were kind of scared of her and uh, never uh, bothered her about it again. And after she died, the letter was found unopened in her desk. Uh, but uh, the casino club still stands. Uh, and by the way, the uh, John Hancock Center has been renamed to 875 North Michigan if, uh, if you haven't been to Chicago lately. Uh, John Hancock Insurance Company has not had any offices in the building for years. So it has been changed to 875 North Michigan. And uh, if you want the naming rights, I'm sure you could buy them. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple other questions before we wrap up. Does the Northwestern Rat Skeller um, still exist? Uh, no. Um, the Rat Skeller was opened by a man named Frank Hesch. And uh, he, he died at age 99 in 2001, living in Naperville. Um, he owned and operated uh, uh, two places at that site, uh, the East Inn and the Northwestern Rathskeller, two English style uh, pubs uh, on East Superior. Uh, his daughter said they had a lot of atmosphere. People went there to make out because it was dark. Uh, he was an artist. He was a graduate of the Art Institute. During World War II, he helped build the Alaskan Highway. And then he came back to to uh, Chicago after the war and settled in a rooming house at 2000 or 206 East Superior. He later bought the building and opened a deli. Uh, then he uh, uh, kept the upstairs as uh, a restaurant, the East End, and the downstairs as the uh, Rathskeller. Uh, he was in business there until 1982 when he sold the business and the business has uh, been uh, demolished uh, in order to build Lurie Children's Hospital. Great, thank you. And then a uh, last question that was submitted is, when um, did Streeterville acquire its name? I know you mentioned Mr. Streeter, but um, when did it acquire the name, the area? Well, that one was a real challenge for me. Uh, I, I couldn't find exactly. I'll tell you when, what I did find. Dr. Aries book on the medical center uh, comments on something that happened in 1915 and said it was in Streeterville. Um, I have a history of Chicago book from when I was in med school dated 1969 and it does mention Streeterville but when I was in med school 1960 to 72 I never heard anybody call the neighborhood Streeterville. Um, there is a statue of George Streeter and his dog at McClure Court and Grand Avenue uh, and it was uh, uh, put there in uh, uh, 2010. So the answer to your question is, <laughs> I don't really know. And I, I assume it is an official name for that neighborhood outlined by Michigan Avenue, Lakeshore Drive and the river, but uh, I, I really don't know. I, I checked multiple sites. If, if anybody knows more than I do, I would appreciate learning. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Guggenheim, thank you for your fascinating um, historical perspective, we really appreciate it. Um, and for more information on the history of Chicago, you can check out Dr. Guggenheim's monthly series in our alumni newsletter as well. Um, we hope everyone enjoyed hearing more about the history of the medical campus and um, we hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.